knows there's a place for us where we could go, where we could be alone. Between city lights, we don't have to hide. I wanna go, do you wanna follow? There's something in the air, I can't explain it, but it's there. Ain't nobody gonna find us in our secret love affair. I don't wanna have to hide no more, it shouldn't be a fair. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the live stream. I'm very happy you're here with me today on a Sunday afternoon or a Sunday evening, depending on where you are in the world. Or, a, heck, it might even be Monday morning. I don't know. <clears throat> I'm so busy uh, chatting in the Discord uh, and answering questions on the chat that I forgot that the music was about to end and uh, wasn't prepared to go. But now I am prepared to go. And uh, one of the things I've learned about live streaming is that if you just uh talk talk with confidence quickly without stopping without repeating yourself too often it helps to say the same thing in a lot of different ways maybe in different inflections you just keep going and people will not realize that you're not actually doing anything and they will uh not tune out they'll just keep watching and uh i feel like there's uh some people who've built whole careers on this but not me i try to keep it useful and eventually your brain catches up with your mouth and you start saying something uh worthwhile <laughs> well, welcome to the live stream oh man i was uh you can't see this you well, you want to see that okay hang on look at this look at this look what i got going on here what's that uh-huh oh Gotta pull up the other, can't pull up one sock and not the other sock. Okay, okay, gotta have your socks even. I was out this morning. I was out this morning in the, I swear it was below freezing. Uh, I went out this morning to the parking garage where I do uh, sort of range penetration testing to do some range and penetration. No, those thermal underwear, it's thermal underwear. Let me tell you what, when it's, first of all, first of all, 
if somehow, and I assume if you don't know about thermal underwear, you're just a, a youngin. Maybe you're from a, as you get older and you get less ability, less able to just be like, nah, I don't care. It's cold. Whatever. I'm fine. Um, as you get older, you, uh, you really need to stay warm. And I learned, uh, when I was camping in college that thermal underwear is like, it's, it's just the bomb. Like it's just this base layer of heat that makes every, every other layer above it 20% more effective. It's awesome. So, uh, like I went out, it was, uh, it, it had to be below freezing this morning. Like the, the numbness that I felt in my fingers when I flew the test flights told me that it was below freezing and, uh, I was all right, except for my fingers. Um, so, uh, now I'm just still wearing them cause I didn't want to take my pants off before the stream. And, uh, I would invite you to speculate about what I was range testing. I'm not going to tell you. Unfortunately, I can't. But I was range testing something over at that parking garage. Whoo! What could it be? Oh, I got to fix that. It always auto plays the comments. I'll get to those comments. I can't tell you. I'm not going to tell you. Pen that's true. It's it's penetration testing, not range testing. That's 100% true. Uh, good point. That's a good point. It's valid. Um, uh, I don't do range testing uh, because uh, range testing requires long range, high altitude flights. And there is no plausible deniability. I can't. I don't feel comfortable. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Like most people. I don't follow every rule 100% of the time. One of the most important things when breaking the rules is that you have like some level of plausible deniability that keeps you from getting in trouble. Um, and I feel like, like, for example, some people ask, Bardwell, do you have a spotter every time you fly on your property? Do you have a spotter? By the way, the FAA would like you to know that, that, that you're supposed to maintain visual line of sight with your aircraft through the whole flight, except you're allowed minor, minor disruptions in line of sight. Like if you had to glance down briefly to check a, a telemetry sensor or if you like briefly flew behind a, a tree or a pole, you're allowed like small, uh, but you're supposed to maintain visual line of sight. And so, of course, as soon as you put the FPV goggles on, you don't have line of sight anymore. And the FAA says, well, the way you do that is you have a separate visual observer is what they call it. And that would mean a person is standing next to you in communication with you, keeping their eyes on the aircraft. And some people say, Bardwell, when you fly at your house, do you have a visual observer? Because you got your goggles on. And I say, uh, it would be silly of me to admit to breaking any rules. So I would never do that. And that's the end of it. <laughs> but I feel like if you were to put up a range test like Wesley Vardy does, where you put the quad in the air, the aircraft in the air, and you fly 30 kilometers one direction, I don't see any way to like plausibly deny that you broke the rules. You know what I mean? So... Um, so that's why I don't do long range testing. I leave it to the, also, I'm just not a long, I'm not, I mean, I could get into long range, I suppose, but given the rules about VLO, VLOS in, uh, in the USA, it'd be tricky. So I just let smart people like, uh, Wesley Vardy do that. And uh, I'm sure he will also be doing some range testing, uh, with whatever it was I was testing. It's a new, uh. It's a new 25 milliwatt video transmitter from Emacs. You guys aren't going to believe it. Um, welcome to the live stream, everybody. Yeah. So the, the argument is, oh, I didn't do this footage. I found it. So the, the, the way that some people get away with long distance flights is that if the FAA it doesn't know 
who the pilot was. And if they don't know what the date of the flight was, then there can be some degree of plausible deniability and they could they could decide that they can't pursue it. I just feel like it's 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 all just how much of a hassle they want they feel like giving you at any given time and I just don't uh I don't know. So um I don't do it. But I do fly in parking garages and do penetration tests because when you're in a parking garage, the FAA does no control over you because you are not in the national airspace. So. Um, anyway, we start with a little uh, FAA discussion and a little, uh, d- little teaser of something that I'm testing that is coming out on my channel soon. Um, welcome to the stream, then, everybody. I'm going to be taking your questions. I'm going to be taking your questions. Uh, here in the in the YouTube chat. How many kilometers is line of sight? Brandon Beans, uh, you have to make a... There, I don't think there's a hard rule. Maybe there is. I don't think there's a hard rule. But you have to say that you could observe the aircraft with your unaided eye. So no binoculars, no telescopes. At a certain point, the aircraft is so small that you, you can't plausibly argue that you are observing it with your unaided eye. Now, I think, you know, you could, there's some flexibility there. Some people with bad vision couldn't see the aircraft at one kilometer. Some people might be able to pick it out at three kilometers. I think that somewhere between one and three kilometers, unless it's a very, very large aircraft, it stops being plausible that you're still observing it. So... Oh, are we going to have the U.S. v. Cosby discussion? You are entitled to use your the airspace on your property, like by building a fence or putting up an antenna, Aerobrat. But once you begin flying an aircraft, the FAA says they have jurisdiction to, to regulate the, the things you do. So the Cosby does not give you the right to fly aircraft above your property without restriction from the FAA. Let's take some questions from the Discord server. The Discord server is where my patrons live. Uh, We just did a cool thing over on the Discord server. I'll talk about it for a second. So Discord just released the ability to do uh, what they call community channels. And what that unlocks is, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. What that unlocks is a new forums functionality which basically means that instead of a chat line, you have forum threads. This is really exciting. Uh, a much better... See, normally on Discord, conversations just flow, and if you're having two conversations at a time, it can be pretty confusing. But now that we have unlocked the forum capability, uh, <laughs> uh, it's pretty exciting. RC Groups is going down, everybody! RC Groups is going down. Yeah, very excited to have done this and made this a, a resource for the folks over there. Uh, if you want to join these people, you got to be a patron, though. Unfortunately, I mean, fortunately for them, keep all the keep all the riffraff out. Um, West Magyar, uh, glasses do not count. Uh, corrective glasses don't count. Uh, uh, th- so when they say the unaided eye. They explicitly uh, allow for corrective lenses, but you're not allowed to do things like binoculars, telescopes, spotting scopes, and so forth. Uh, Everybody thinks they find all these weird loopholes, but usually the FAA has thought of it. I mean, it doesn't mean there aren't dumb things that the FAA does, clearly. Biwu wants me to check out the Pyrodrone. The Pyrodrone, oh... It's, is it, I mean, is it basically just, it's a, it's a Zorro with AG-01 gimbals and flash colors. I mean, that's cool. A Zorro is a good radio. AG-01 gimbals are good gimbals. And uh, everybody likes flash colors. Um, I mean, I don't think there's anything like unique about it in terms of like, is it better than just a regular Zorro? Uh, it, it's cool what Radio Master is doing by putting out all these custom colors and stuff 
it does lead to a little bit of confusion where people may think that there's something special about uh, the product or that it, it's, it's, it's cosmetic. But, uh, um, yeah, nice. It's a nice radio. <sighs> Paul Robertson, we're going to take a question from the regular chat. Oh, by the way, before I do that, uh, if you want to make sure I read your message, I read a lot of messages, but I can't read them all. Look at all these messages. Right? Look at all these messages. I read a lot of messages, but if you want to make sure I read your messages, hit the dollar sign right down here and leave a super chat, and I will read those just a little bit later in the stream. But let's take a question here from Paul Robertson, who asks, if there is no Betaflight 4.3 target for my flight controller, can I make my own target, or do I have to buy another flight controller? Paul, this is a weird one. Um, I wish you would tell me what your target is, Paul. So, like, one of the things that happens, Paul... Uh, here, let me grab a... Just plug in a flight controller here. One of the things that happens, Paul, is that target names can change uh, between, between different versions of Betaflight. So, for example... Oh, no, that's not where I want to be. Here's where I want to be. For example... If we're going to go flash our flight controller and I look for Maytech F405 ST, Maytech F405, what is it? They change F405 STD. Uh, did they? Oh, I picked a bad example. Um, that's, that's too bad. Well, I, I thought I was going to pick an example that worked, but it didn't. Uh, they, they've changed the names of like of targets sometimes. So sometimes you'll find that with Betaflight 4.3, the target is one name. And for Betaflight 4.2 and earlier, the target is a different name. And either one will work, even though they're not the same. Like, I know you're hesitant to flash the wrong target, but sometimes they change the names of targets. I can tell you that. Um, what if I type JBF7? Well, where's the... See, look. Where's the JBF7 Pro? That's weird. Or the V2. What's What have they done? There's the V2. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, thank goodness. So sometimes they change the names of the targets. What, uh... Has he answered what is the name of the target? Maytech F405. That's the one. That's the one. That's the exact one I was looking for. That's so funny. Um, so they changed the name of it to Maytech F405 STD standard. I don't know where the F... I, it used to be Maytech F405. And then they changed it to F405 STD. So that's that's what you need to do. You need to just flash the STD. That didn't sound right. Uh, Paul Robertson, flash may take F four hundred five STD. They just changed the name. So that's 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 the answer. Um, now a more nuanced answer to your question is that if you wanted to, you could go into the flight controller. One second, you could go into the flight controller. And you could type dump all. And technically, if you do a dump all, if you go up to the top and you grab these resource lines and you grab these timer lines and you grab these DMA lines, that is basically most of what the board definition is. So in theory... You could flat, you could copy those lines. You could go to your firmware updating tab and you could flash the generic target like uh, STM, STM32 F405. You could flash the generic STM32 F405 target 
and then paste those lines in and it would theoretically finish complete the target definition but you don't have to do that just flash the the, the they just renamed the target it didn't go away um Casey Henderson wants to know, should I convert to BT 2.0 or would it not be worth it? Casey, it's 100% worth it. BT 2.0 is a just categorically, it's a better connector. It has less voltage drop, less resistance than PH 2.0. You will get better performance. Now, you do need to solder a BT 2.0 pigtail onto your aircraft. And so you can't just use an adapter. That, that will negate the advantage. And depending on what aircraft you have, there may or may not be BT 2.0 batteries commonly available. So if we're talking about a 65 millimeter Tiny Whoop and you're using those 300 milliamp hour 1S packs that are used with Tiny Whoops, they're available with BT 2.0 all the time. If you had a, something like a, a 1S 650 milliamp hour battery uh, used with a three inch toothpick, well, those commonly come with XT 30s, so that's not the best example. My, my point is there, make sure that you can get BT 2.0 batteries in the size that you commonly use, and then you will need to solder on a new pigtail, but it will improve the performance of the aircraft. So yeah, I would say confidently, yes, it will improve performance. Strong tip, if you need to install a video transmitter and you don't have battery voltage pads, on the flight controller, just solder it right where the battery solders onto the flight controller. As long as you're giving it the correct voltage, that's going to be fine. Majkar Hola asks, why are there no test reports or reviews of Luminaire motors? There aren't a lot of test reports and reviews of of many motors these days, um, to be honest with you. So they're not publishing thrust hands, and I, I don't know anybody out there who is testing motors and publishing thrust stand data. Like Chris Rosser did a batch a little while ago, but nobody out there is, is just testing a bunch of motors or anything. So I don't think it's unique to Lumineer Motors. Like a lot of manufacturers will publish test thrust stand uh, tables when a new motor comes up, but uh, many of them don't. I don't think it really means a lot. Um, a lot of that stuff has sort of fallen by the wayside, uh, especially just, I mean, it's expensive, it's time consuming, and uh, I'm not sure uh, there's a lot of reward in it for the people who are doing it. So they eventually just get bored and burn out. H2O asks, thank you for being a patron, H2O. When I fly behind my house, my LQ goes down to 75 or 80. Do I need more output power or, or a different packet rate? Either. So H2O, you could increase the output power of your controller, and that would improve your LQ, probably. You could also lower your packet rate to a slower packet rate. And that would increase your LQ as well. Either one of those things will do will will have the same effect. It's just which one it is going to work best for you. Okay. Um. Gadget RC. I can't tell if you are intentionally. Uh, trying to <laughs> get me to plug my own product. Uh, what FPV starter kit would you suggest to new pilots? Um, if you want to build your own, if you want to build your own, I have a DIY drone kit with GetFPV. It comes in both a DJI HD and a uh, analog version. And uh, you could pick it up. It's got a full build tutorial by yours truly and is, uh, is a great way to learn how to build a quad. 
Um, if you're looking for something cheaper and, and smaller, something like the Emacs uh, Easy Pilot Pro will get you going. Uh, it's not going to have the same performance as a big quad, but maybe that's a good thing. Uh, let's read some of the, uh, let's read some of the, uh, super chats coming in. Uh, the first one is from Matt Shonen. Thank you for a thousand yen. I lost my new Reckon 6 build. Return to home was set up and working. Would you take a look for feedback? Hope to avoid, uh, this when rebuilding. Uh, let's take a look at Matt's, uh, video. I'm not sure how much I'll be able to tell you. A lot of times these things don't have a lot of information. It's just like, whoops, then it crashes. Minute 9.30. So hey we've... guys, and welcome back to the channel. Well, today... I've... Oh, hang on. Uh, Quark. Need... And the disturbing part is I really have no idea why that accident happened. It ditched into the ocean and... Oh well, yeah, there it well, goes. I didn't have any pre-warnings why. So the last frame of the goggles recorded, I will share at the end of this. All right, all right. Don't YouTube me though. I'm here. I'm here for the money shot. Oh, I can't can't have the music. Can't risk a. Uh... I'll get a little. So let's just look at the flying and see if there's anything suspicious about the flying. Unfortunately. No motor sound, unfortunately, so. Uh, I've never wanted to subscribe more. Um, can't hear the motor sounds. Uh, looking for any signs of anything going wrong, like twitches. I don't think so, though. If there was a little bit of movement, it probably would just be the wind. I mean, there's a lot of wind out on the ocean or wherever. So I do see some bumping. I can't tell if that's anything mechanical or just the wind. Here we are coming up to the crash. Would be nice to see the OSD. Is this at 1x speed? You're moving. You're cooking. Is this sped up? Okay, so here's what I see. Uh, there's a fish. I think it's a trout. No. Uh, what I see is that the props are still spinning. So I would say this is not a fail-safe. If this was a fail-safe, the motors would have stopped at the same time and the quad would have fallen. Um, so this is not a fail-safe. I also don't think it's a, like a broken prop or a failed motor because a broken prop or a failed motor, I would expect to see a whoop, 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 spin. And what we see here is it rolls one way and then the other way. Watch again. We'll put it on 50% speed. 50% speed. We'll watch it again. Okay. It feels, I don't think it's the battery. James thinks it's the battery. So he says that, uh, he says that it, it, the battery was at 3.7 volts. To me, a, a, a battery would not cause this do, do, jerking. Whenever I've run a battery all the way down, uh, I'm flying and I'm raising the throttle and I'm raising the throttle and I'm raising the throttle and the quad is not going up. And then whomp, it just sort of plows into the ground at full throttle. Um, it feels like one of the motors glitched and then it bounced back and tried to recover. We're at 50% speed again. 
It feels like we had like a motor glitch or some other mechanical problem that caused it to twitch. Which way does it go first? I think it goes front. Okay, so it begins by dipping to the front and to the right. So this says that the front right motor like stopped making thrust. And then it catches and bounces back. Let's look at the prop. Let's look at that front right prop. Is the prop could the prop be loose? Did he turn right? Uh Magikar thinks maybe he turned right. If he began to turn right, that would explain the initial bank to the right. Does the bank to the right look like a turn? No, because he's nosing down too. He's nosing down too. So he's turning to the right, but he's also nosing down. And I don't think he was trying to nose down here. So I don't think this was an intentional move. I'm looking at that front right prop. Let's just uh, see what we got going on here. It's still spinning. You guys can't see it. Hold on. The front right prop is still spinning. Spinning. And now... It speeds up and catches again. And now we're going the other way. But then why didn't it just... And now it's straightened out. Wait. Now it's pitching forward. What is it doing? And now it's just flying into the ocean. So this sequence of movements is, is difficult to explain. It's wobbling. It, it, a bad motor or a broken prop would probably just result in a death roll. The way it wobbles back and forth is hard to explain. It like, catches itself and is having almost... Uh, it, it's, it's hard to explain. Um, if if we had a situation where there was a loose prop and the prop caught itself, you would see a dip and catch. But you wouldn't see it going back and forth like this. This is difficult to explain, to tell you the truth. That's my analysis, though. Kmart FPV, thanks for a $5 super chat. Can you talk about your first live streams? What went well? What uh, what did you immediately fix for the next stream? How many watchers? Uh, Kmart, my early live streams were extremely uh, casual. And uh, in fact, my very first one, my very first live stream, I was testing live streaming out. I didn't actually realize I had gone live. And then I was like, oh, I guess I'm live. And I was doing some black box log analysis and just talking it through while people watched. Um... And then I slowly uh, got a little more. I did black box log analysis for a long time. And then I would edit them down and publish them. Um, uh, what went well? I mean, I don't know. Here I am. Um, they, they, there's not a, I don't have a lot positive to say about them in terms of their production. Um, but uh, they were fun. They were casual. Uh, did not have a lot of watchers, you know, 50 or 100 watchers. Uh, but yeah, my very first live stream was a total accident. I hit go live thinking I was just doing a test, an unlisted test stream, and then people were watching. And I was like, oh, I guess I shouldn't, uh, I guess I'm going to uh, talk about what I'm doing. And I just dove into it. Um, Coelho FPV, thank you for our $5 super chat. I've run a Crossfire full-size module of version 617. The receivers are varied. They all have LQ issues when using 150 hertz, solid at 50 hertz. Uh, Coelho, I would not expect link presets to affect LQ, so set that aside. Link presets affect your stick feel and the smoothness of the quads movement, but LQ is is a purely radio thing. Um, 
if you have consistently low LQ on multiple receivers, then the first thing I would want to do is test a different module to see if your module is damaged in some way. That's the bottom line. That's probably not the answer you want to hear, but that's, I think, the correct answer from a troubleshooting perspective. Bad Habit RC, thanks for a $2 super chat. Have you seen the new Steam Deck? Pretty awesome. Uh, the new Steam Deck, yeah, uh, the it's a pretty amazing piece of kit. There's no doubt that it's it's like a, a gaming computer shrunk down to the size of a Nintendo Switch. Pretty freaking cool. What are good LQ numbers, asks Matt Thor, for Express LRS 250 hertz? Uh, LQ, here's the thing. There's no such thing as a bad or good LQ threshold where there's a hard threshold and below this is bad and above this is good. Um, LQ just means the percent of packets that are getting through. So if you have an LQ of 100, every data packet that the controller sent was received by the receiver. How many packets are you comfortable with losing? I've known people who were doing long range flights with Express LRS. They had a, an aircraft that was flying a waypoint mission, so they didn't need to directly be in control of it. And they had an LQ of 15. It was not really flyable if you needed to move the sticks because only 15% of your packets are getting through. But it was still enough to, like, you know, control the aircraft in, in that in that sense. Um, I, I think for a lot of people who fly Express LRS, they want the highest LQ they can get because one of the whole sort of selling points of Express LRS is low latency and high packet rates. And to say, I have a thousand hertz with four millisecond latency, but I have bad LQ, so half those packets aren't even getting there, sort of doesn't make sense. So I think most of the time I would, I would try to keep my LQ above, say, 95%. But LQ is totally flyable if you're not too picky down to certainly 80% and maybe a little lower. The other thing to keep in mind is that if you've got an, a, a, a thousand hertz packet rate and an LQ of 10, that means on average, you're getting a hundred hertz. Now, I think everybody would agree that a hundred hertz is perfectly flyable. So the, the flip side of that though, is that if you have a hundred hertz, the packets are evenly spaced out and all of them are getting there. Whereas if you have a thousand hertz packet rate with a 10% LQ, it's unpredictable. They're getting corrupted. It's, it's not going to be a good experience. Uh, Bad Habit RC is telling me he meant to ask about the new Stream Deck. Oh, well, you said Steam Deck. I haven't seen the new Stream Deck. I have a Stream Deck. Is there a new one? The Stream Deck Plus. Ooh, all the feels. So it doesn't have enough buttons. Is there a big one? Where's the big one? I don't need to turn any knobs. Oh, it's a touch screen. That's fancy. I mean, that's fancy. I don't know. It depends a lot on the integration. Like I could see this being useful, like if it integrates really well with Premiere, I could see the knobs being useful for like adjusting parameters that you adjust all the time. But it would have to be have a really good API where it could integrate with the controls very cleanly. Uh, I probably wouldn't replace my Stream Deck with this. I'm happy with buttons and I'm not actually super, I, I mostly use it for streaming and not for general productivity. Um, continuing with the super chats, Coelho FPV, thanks for a $5 super chat. Any reason not to root and flash WTFOS? Does audience or spectator mode still work? Everything works as normal, Coelho. They don't change the functionality. They only increase the functionality. They do not decrease or remove any functionality. 
Um, the only reason not to do it is if you're concerned about bricking them. I will say I have uh, rooted and put WTFOS on my goggles, my DJI goggles, and probably eight or nine different v Vistas. And one of those Vistas, the battery died while I was uh, charging it, while I was rooting it. I just mistakenly put a dead battery on there. It was my screw up. You should always check the battery before you start rooting, right? So it doesn't, and I got unlucky. Now, the rooting process is relatively safe. And if the battery dies during the rooting process or the rooting is interrupted most of the time, and I've had this happen too, like something went wrong. I just unplugged it and plugged it back in. Uh, most of the time, it's not bricked. It continues to function and you can just root it again and it works fine. But on one of these times, I got unlucky and the uh, Vista w just red light wouldn't work. I couldn't get it to connect to the COM port. And if I wasn't friends with certain people, it would have been toast. I would have just, I would have probably just had to replace it. And I, you know, and, and the, the person who helped me fix it was like, wow, I kind of can't imagine how this happened. He's like, there's a, there's a tiny window during the rooting process, like a, if you happen to hit this tiny, tiny window just right when you power cycle, I guess theoretically you could brick it, right? But if you want to know why not to root, there's a very small chance that if anything goes wrong, you could brick your Vista. And if you don't know the right people, it might not be recoverable. Um, but uh, I guess that's that's what I would say about that. But I've rooted all of mine. It's great. Uh, Matt Shonen, Matt Shonen, thank you for 200 yen. Could it be a bird strike? I mean, it's possible. I guess it's possible. Who knows? Four oh six from above. Uh, thank you for a ten dollars super chat. I asked a question in the Discord and felt like donating as well. Thank you so much for your donation and for being a patron. Uh, let me find your question in the Discord server. Max Cut. Max Cut. Where's your question, Max Cut? I don't see it. Max Cut FPV. What is he asking? Um, you made the quad. Ah, here we go. Uh, you asked in the Max, you asked this question in the coupon codes channel. That's not a good place to ask questions. Uh is that the question you're asking about, Max? The the or is it the yaw axis jitters? Wait, this one is from nine eighteen. That's all though no, that's all back in September. Your latest post was announcing that you completed a build. I don't see a question from you, Max. I just see you posting that your build was complete a week ago. So, um, thank you for your donation. I don't see a question from you. I'm sorry to say. Is there more than one Max Cut FPV? There is. You have you have multiple accounts, Max. Making you're making my life difficult. <laughs> Unless there's two people with the same name. Um. I want to order the new Walksnail VRX, but I'm not sure what VTX to get. I fly mostly five inch. Well, then get the get the one watt VT. Uh, the the wait, sorry, that's HD zero. Um, get the get the regular VTX. You really only have two choices, right? There's the there's the one S VTX and the big VTX. You want the big one. If you if you then get into whoops, you would get the one S one. Uh, but for any any quad that isn't a one S tiny whoop, get the big one, because that additional output power is 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 I think very very useful. Six six one FPV. That's a good point. Six six one FPV reminding me that rooting interferes with the uh, video out. Oh, that's a good point. I said that there's no downside to rooting. It interferes with the video out. You're right. 
Now, can you hold down the bind button and power them up and restore that function? That is correct, though. Uh, I had forgotten that in this moment, but that is correct. If you regularly use uh, FPV out or live view or anything like that, rooting messes it up. I think they're working on fixing it. I don't know if they have yet. David Heinmiller, thank you for a $5 super chat. Oh, Abra the Ham says you can boot around it to get video out, but then you lose your OSD. Got it. Uh, David Heinmiller. Thank you for a $5 super chat. Can the multi-protocol module be swapped with an internal express LRS in the TS in the TS16 Max Radio Master? Yes. So David, those internal modules are swappable, but I don't think that Radio Master sells the Express LRS internal module separately. They do sell the four-in-one module. So I don't know where you would get one. Like if I search for Radio Master. Express LRS internal module. That's not it. Oh, well, I'll be damned. They do. I'll be damned. Is that right? No, that's the Zorro. That's close, though. Uh, what should I look for? Stop. Stop with the pop-ups. Don't, don't, don't be popping up. Let's look at TX16S Mark II accessories. Do they have... Replacement mainboard, four in one module. They surely are selling it as a spare part. Are they? It doesn't seem like they are. Yeah, so they sell the. This is weird. I, I, I this is what I remember is that you can buy the four in one module separately, and you can buy the Express LRS module for the Zorro but not for the TX-16S. Um, if you can find the internal Express LRS module, or if you pull one out of, a, out of a, a radio for some reason, then yes, you can swap it out. Uh, Alan Rugg, thank you for a $5 super chat. How would you change the orientation of the flight controller in beta flight? In your perfect build, it was backward. So you did not explain what if. I I am, can't say for sure that I didn't show that in the video. It, this is the first person who's reached out to me to say that I didn't show how to fix the board alignment in the video. So I think I did it in the video, but I'm happy to show it again. Uh, so what you do is... In beta flight, you go to configuration, and here in board and sensor alignment, you choose the roll degrees, pitch degrees, and yaw degrees. So if the board was rotated 180 degrees backwards, you would choose 180 yaw degrees as your rotation. And what you need to know is that when you hold the quadcopter in your hand and pitch forward, it pitches forward. Do you see how right now, hang on, let me reset this, let me reset this. Do you see how right now I am pitching forward, but the aircraft on screen is rolling to the left? That means that the alignment is wrong, okay? And I need to fix that. And now I'm gonna roll, but it's pitching, even though I'm rolling. And now I'm yawing and yaw is correct. So that's how you would fix that, and you would do it here in configuration uh, in the board and sensor alignment section. Did I put that in the build? I must have put that in the build. Otherwise, like 500 people would have complained to me that it didn't that their quadcopter freaked out when they tried to take off. I must have. I must have. I mean, it's a lot. Of, it's a long video. 
So there's a lot of steps. Checkboard alignment. Bam! Basic check that we need to do to make sure that the flight controller and the motors are all sort of in alignment. And it's done here in the setup tab. I wish they had a wizard for this, just like they have a wizard okay. for the motors. Maybe they'll yeah. do that in the next version of Betaflight. Facing forward, comparing the 3D model. So if I tip the quad to the right, the 3D model tips to the right, to the left, the 3D model tips to the left, model tilts forward, moving. I definitely installed the flight controller flipped around backwards, but there uh -huh. you go. It's okay. So what I show, interesting. So I show that I had the flight controller flipped around backwards, but when I test the alignment, it checks out and I'm confused by that. So then what I'm confusing, but okay. This section of the video is going to be about setting up a great go. I did 100% correctly that. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure why, uh, but when I installed it, it was facing backwards and yet the alignment checked out. And so I did not change it. And I assume that everyone else who builds the quad will have the same experience. And since most people, since no one has mentioned this before, I assume that that checks out. Uh, but that's how you would fix it. Sucks to release a tutorial and leave a step out and then, you know, hundreds of people screw their quadcopter up because you screwed up your tutorial. Yeah. Um, Sebi D F P V, thank you for a 10 Canadian dollars. Question in the Discord. Okay. Sebi D. There are two things I'm getting with my rooted. No, that's not Sebi D. Where is Sebi D? I'm building a towing quad and I want to install a V-Fly camera switcher. I usually run Express LRS. I asked the devs and they suggested to go through a pin IO box, have a JBF2 flight controller. Can you get me started? You need an aux output to control your camera switcher, Sebi D. Um, here's what I would start you, Sebi D. This is an I'm old... Joshua Bardwell. Oh, YouTube. Oh, YouTube. I hate, I hate, I'm hating. I hate Google so much right now. Look what they've done. Hang on. Pause your question, Sebi D. Google just started doing this. It's so annoying. So look, if you do a search and you click on a video, it doesn't take I'm you Joshua to Bardwell. It doesn't take you to YouTube. It doesn't take you to YouTube. It takes you to this Google interstitial page where you can't Oh, you like you like my channel? No, don't subscribe. Don't go to my channel. No, no, no. What Google is going to do is they're going to show you my video. They're not going to show you any of my actual content. Look. I'm Joshua Bardwell. Look here. Look at this video description with my call to action. Support me. My my affiliate links. No. Suggested videos from me. No, they're going to give you this. Oh, and they're going to put their own product links underneath the video. So they're explicitly going to replace my product links, my affiliate links with their product links. And it's just annoying for me when I'm trying to find my own content that, that this happens. So now it's an extra I'm click. Bardwell and you're it's an extra click to actually get to my channel and my videos. I'm Joshua Bardwell. Because they want to freaking get that money off those advertising. Oh, and by the way, when they show you an ad here, I get a cut of it, right? But when they do this bullshit, if somebody clicks this link, Google gets paid, but I don't. So F you, Google. F you. This is bullshit. This is bullshit. 
We had a deal, Google. I put content on your website. You serve the content. We both split the ad money. It was a good deal. This is bullshit. It's bullshit. They're doing it not just for me. It's for everybody. See, look. They want, and the whole reason they're doing this, let's be honest, the entire reason they're doing this is because they want to automatically detect products in the video and then they want to sell advertising links or, or affiliate links or whatever to those products. So Google is getting paid for this click, I assume. Right? Are they? Is that not a, oh, is that not a, surely that's like some kind of an affiliate click, isn't it? Why would they do this? No, that's that doesn't look like a paid a paid link. It's just a search link. Shit. Then why would they do this? This is just annoying. Like I clicked on a YouTube link. Take me to YouTube. All right, anyway. Take me to YouTube. I might be wrong about those being ad paid links. It looks like just a search link. So I might be wrong about that. Um Sebby D, I, I assume I get the views, Bobby Bags. Uh, Sebby D, this is where I would start you. This is the simplest, most straight video, straightforward video I have about setting up real pit. Now, uh, pin IO. Now, in this case, we're setting up a real pit, but it doesn't matter. Camera switcher, real pit. The process of doing the the pin IO is the same. Okay, then. There is a more a more detailed tutorial here or here. These are the next videos I would this is like the super detailed one that has more detail than you really need. So if you really want to know and this one is also more up to date. So if you really want to know, that's the one. All right. Good deal. Linux Barista. Thank you for a $5 super chat. I'm considering to start starting to buy 6S batteries. Will I get more flight time than I would on 4S if I'm running them with a motor output limit? No. Nope. Uh, prop, maybe. Mm, maybe. The thing I, I notice about 6S is that you notice the sag less and so you can fly the battery closer to 3.0 volts while still having sort of usable response. I don't know to what degree 2400 kV motors with a motor output limit would change that. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think you're going to get significantly more flight time. It'll depend heavily on the quality of the batteries and the size of the batteries. But... Um, do be careful because you you may find yourself tending to kill batteries if you don't actually watch the voltage and just fly based on feel because they, they feel like they sag less. Um, Spike Spine, thank you for a $5 super chat. I'm looking to start 5-inch racing next year. I was wondering if there's a bind and fly plug-and-play drone you recommend. I'm also okay building. Uh, yeah, so I have a website. Do you guys know about my website? Do you know about my website? I have a website. It's called fpvknowitall.com. It's tongue in cheek. Don't freak out. And on that, there is a racing drones page, which includes some bind and flies. Now, it's tricky to find really good bind and fly racing drones because most racers build their own. I think the Lumineer Chief is solid. It's based on uh, Alex Campbell. That's Chief FPV. It's based on his his build, his frame, and his motors. Um, and it's solid. And it's a complete bind and fly ready to go. So that's nice. Only available with Crossfire. Oh, back ordered. F you. Um, another one that is worth a look. I, I, I'm not sure they're still even making the Chief, to be honest with you. What's that iFlight bind and fly racing drone? It's not the R7. I thought it was. What is it? Uh, 
what is the iFlight 5-inch Binafly? The R5? Maybe it's the R5. The Mach R5. So the iFlight Mach R5 is going to be in stock and is a solid choice. Uh, their, their choice of motors is pretty weird to me. I kind of don't understand it. It's one of the only Bind and Fly racing drones you can get with DJI. So there's an analog version as well. Um, he's asking about racing specifically, so I'm not giving him freestyle drones. Um, this is the, that one is like uh, in stock, so that's nice. The Emacs Hawk 5 is a solid choice too, although you'll be locking yourself into Emacs's uh, electronics and motors. Um, by the way, you guys, so those are my thoughts. You can also reach out to Catalyst Machine Works to ask them to build you one. By the way, guys, happy to tell you that the toothpick page is live. The toothpick page is live. On my website. Thank you to Aaron Ciotti for working with me on this and some other folks too. But he probably deserves the lion's share of the credit. Yep. If you're looking to build a toothpick and you're looking for suggested parts, these are our suggestions. So, uh, very, very glad to be able to launch another page on the website. And uh, go check that out. Spike Spine, most people would tell you to build your own, and they'd say to build a 533 switchback with 533 motors. That's what a lot of racers are racing these days. In fact, freaking didn't Min Chan Kim fly 533 motors, even though he has his own sponsored motor with T Motor? Uh, he, I, I saw Min Chan post in the last couple months. I don't remember the exact race he was going to. Maybe it was Nationals. Was it? It was. I think it might have been Nationals. He posted a pic of his race rigs, and they didn't have Min Chan Kim motors on them. And I was like, you know, you're supposed to use your own motors. And I, uh, you know, I didn't actually literally say that to him, but I was like, oh, okay. But apparently, everyone flies five thirty three motors. So, um. Josh Fisk wants to know, does the Omnifixo stay put when soldering? Yes. How well do the magnets keep the ball joint from moving? Pretty well. Um, you can adjust the little uh, rubber bushing, r little rubber ring to change the tension. Uh, it's fine, though. It's not an issue. People, people are worried it's an issue. I haven't found it to be an issue. Um... Okay, one more, one more super chat. Uh, Brandon Weber, thanks for a five dollar super chat. I've designed a five inch frame to be three D printed. You've you've wasted your time and ruined your life. This was a huge mistake, and now you've admitted it in public. I've always wondered why this isn't done. Well, you're about to find out. Other than the obvious, is there a reason this wouldn't work? <laughs> oh. oh. So, Brandon, um, I uh, uh, let me start by not being a hater. Uh, oh, too late. I was already a hater. Uh, Brandon, follow your dreams. Right? Never let people tell you that what you want to do can't be done. Uh, and if something is – if you have a passion for something – then even if it's a waste of time because you'll fail in the end, just do it because you have a passion for it. So many times I have worked with people on projects and you start working on the project and you realize it's not going to work and then you pivot to a different direction and you realize it's not going to work and then you pivot to a different direction and you realize it's not going to work and eventually something that you're doing works and all of the things you did leading up to that a lot of times they contribute in some way whether it's a direct uh, whether it's a, a tool that you developed 
that turns out to not be useful how you intended, but it's useful in some other way, or whether it's just the lessons that you learned from failing. So I'm going to tell you the reason this is a terrible idea and it's not going to work, but I don't want that to sound like I'm saying, don't do it, especially if you're happy doing it and you love doing it. If you like designing frames and you want to design a 3D printed frame, do it. Because the, the number one thing the world needs is people who are doing something that they're passionate about and excited about and interested in. And, and, and you're just going to, not only will you be a better person and a happier person, you will also uh, probably be more successful in the long run versus if you just was like, I don't know, Bard will say this is a bad idea. I guess I won't do it. Okay. So with that all out of the way. Uh, the reason five inch frames are bad for 3d printing is that the materials commonly used to 3d print frames, especially if we're talking about FDM printers, which I assume that we are, all of those materials do not have the right combination of strength, stiffness, and lightweight to function well as a, uh, quadcopter frame. In order to get sufficient durability, they have to be heavy. They often don't have enough stiffness and you end up with resonance problems. A lot of the time, people try to emulate a carbon fiber frame by 3D printing plastic sheets. And that just doesn't work because it's way too floppy. And then I've seen people who do 3D printed frames where the 3D printed frame is this carefully designed shell. And that's really how you'd have to do it. Carbon fiber is very good at being a stiff, strong sheet, right? Well, carbon fiber is also very good at being molded into shapes, but it's very expensive. So the big advantage of, of 3D printing is that you can print in almost arbitrary shapes and you can optimize the design. And somebody once sent me a five inch quadcopter frame that they had optimized with like computers. And they were like, this is the best balance of strength and weight. And you could never do this with carbon. And I was like, okay. And then I flew it and I crashed it and it broke. Because everything breaks when you crash it at 70 miles an hour. Carbon fiber breaks when you crash it at 70 miles an hour. The point is that when it breaks, it, how, how much abuse can it take till it breaks? And then more importantly, when it breaks, how easy is it to repair? And if you've got this custom printed carbon fiber shell tube thing, I'm not carbon fiber, 3D printed carbon fiber, uh, I've gotten too excited. I can't talk. If you've got this custom 3D printed shell, then you can't repair it when it breaks. You have to just replace the whole thing. And that's a pain in the ass. So it just turns out that for quadcopter frames, above certainly five inches, maybe, maybe down in the three inch toothpick range, you could 3d print them. And certainly I know people have 3d printed tiny whip frames. It just turns out that carbon fiber is the absolute perfect combination of strength, stiffness, lightness, durability. It just is the miracle material for this application. Um, and ma maintainability. Because with carbon fiber sheets, when something breaks, you just open it up, you take it out, you replace the arm that broke, etc. But then you can just print another one. Yeah, but then you have to, in order to get a really strong 3D printed frame, and I say this as someone, people semi-regularly tell me that I'm wrong about this and offer to send me a 3D printed frame. And they ask me to test it, and then I test it, and then I find out that I was right, and it breaks. So I'm not just talking out my ass here. I, I have I have tested these. Um, in order to get the strong the strongest ones that I've used have been basically one piece, and then as soon as it breaks, you can print another one. But you have to move all your electronics. What a pain in the ass! You have to rebuild your whole quadcopter every time you break an arm. No, no, what a nightmare! Just use carbon. So. Brandon Weber, if you do go this direction, you have to be looking at more exotic materials like Nylon X 
Uh, if you're trying to print it out of PLA or PETG, it will probably fly if you're half decent at designing it and you don't just design it as a sheet. It will probably fly, but then as soon as you crash it, it's just going to explode. And if you're like, oh, I'll just build another one. Sure, okay, you're only out the cost of your filament and your time. But also, you're going to be tearing up motors. You, you know, you're going to be damaging your electronics. You're going to spend a lot of money. So, um, that's my take on that. If you really go that direction, look at exotic filament. the The best one I ever saw was made out of Nylon X, and it was pretty durable and pretty strong. My only complaint about the Nylon X frame was that it was a completely encased shell, and in order to maintain the quad, you basically had to gut the whole thing. This is the closest I ever saw somebody go. All righty. Uh, yeah, here's some, here's some uh, cute. So here's where 3D printing starts to become semi-viable. This, I'm guessing, is a 3-inch or a 4-inch. What size frame is this? Uber, Uber Nero, Uber Nero. What is what size frame is that? A three inch. Like at this size and weight, three D printing sort of becomes viable. It's a three inch nano long range. Carbon is still better, but th but it becomes semi viable. Yeah. So. Bob H. wants to know, why do you think Walksnail didn't... Why do you think Walksnail didn't put any input on their goggles? Do you think it's possible for them to add video, video input through the USB port or any other way? Who knows? Uh, they just decided not to do it, probably because they wanted to lock you in, right? They wanted to lock you in. I've lost my chat here. Hold on. Uh, they didn't. Uh, maybe they didn't want the complexity of analog input or anything. But like, why not have an HDMI input? Uh, as a business decision, they just decided that wasn't the right thing for them to do. Um. Could they do it? USB seems seems iffy. Uh, the WTFOS devs have talked about doing USB input to the DJI V2 goggles, and they think that it's doable, but would be difficult to have consistently good latency. Preston Jeter says, what size frame and motors would be a good choice for sub-250 and get as close to a 5-inch freestyle performance? Um... Uh, what a great opportunity for me to plug my website again. Whee! I've got a page on my website, sub 250 gram. Uh, I'll put that here. This again, this is largely curated by Aaron Ciotti, who is the, uh, the micro king. Uh, and if you need sub 250, I put, I like the Gep RC Smart 3.5 as a, as a just a bind and fly, the Baby Hawk Two HD is also good. Um, if you're gonna build your own, I think we're revamping this page a little bit. I think Ciadi is changing this page around. Um, you're only gonna get so close to a five inch, though. To be honest, I mean you just have to make a certain concessions to weight and physics. Uh, Willie asks, today was my first time with the HD0 Freestyle 1 Watt VTX on my Nazgul 5. What's your recommendation for a better antenna? Um, I, I think that the stock antennas that come with HD0 are okay. Unlike like the Walksnail antennas, which are just trash. Uh, I, I I mean, they're probably not the best you could possibly get. I, pr I would probably get like 
I mean, Lumineer Axie is a safe choice. Uh, the matchstick antenna from TrueRC is a safe choice. Uh, you're going to spend a little more money on those, but uh, if you want to make sure you're getting the best performance, that's what I would suggest. Am I getting the HD0 goggles? Asks Pinko, Pinko FPV. Uh, yeah, uh, yes. So I am going to get the HD0 goggles. Um, I talked to... Uh, I talked to Ryan and Carl about that. I basically said, hey, uh, do I need to buy these goggles in the pre-order? Do you guys plan to send them as a, uh, you know, as a review copy? I just, just want to know uh, whether I should try to get into the pre-order or not. Uh, and they said uh, that they would be willing to send a review copy with a discount, uh, but that uh, they, they didn't say that they were going to just send a pair for free. Which is fine. Uh, I, like I said, it doesn't matter. I just needed to know, uh, and I felt like uh, for the for the value of a discount, I would probably rather just buy a set at full price and then be able to like be like, mm, I'm independent. See, it doesn't really matter. I mean, the review whether they sent me a free pair of goggles, whether they gave me a discount code, or whether they. By the way, for the record, they also said. You must disclose that these were discounted. You must disclose this. There was no shady business, for the record. They're very straight shooters, and 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 they they're always. I would not want to imply that they were doing anything shady, but um, I mean, I can imagine they don't have a lot of budget to send out a million review copies to a million people. Uh, I think they're they're operating a little bit on a shoestring. They don't have that sixty million dollar Red Cat Nasdaq money. So, uh, so I said, well, you know what? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. So the review would have been the same either way when the reviewer says, I bought these with my own money. So given the choice between, you know, saving a couple hundred dollars on the cost of the goggles and just buying them outright and being able to say I bought them outright, I was just like, I'll just buy them. Um, I did not, however, <laughs> I did not get in on the pre-order. So I hope that they're going to like, let me buy one off the, you know, if they were gonna, I hope that they're gonna like hold one for me, but yeah, I'll be getting them. Oriel Carreras, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I'm doing a, some work with BL Heli 32. I don't understand the difference between BL Heli S and BL Heli 32. Uh, BL Heli S is open source based on i think it's an eight is an eight bit processor it's based on a slower processor and, and bl32 is closed source and based on a faster 32 bit processor bl32 has some features that bl s doesn't because it's based on a faster processor they can just do more things um but those are the main differences. Adit Chauhan wants to know, is the Eoshin EV800D good? It's, uh, it's good for 80 or 100 bucks. It's a good cheap goggle. It's not a great goggle, but for 80 or 100 bucks, it's worth... If that's your budget, it's a solid choice. Would I be able to FPV through my house? Asks Caprut. There's a lot of logs in the walls. It's, uh, it's difficult to say. Uh, it, that's difficult to predict. Maybe. Depends on the output power of your VTX and the quality of your antenna. A lot of people FPV around their house, but their house might be, you know, mostly sheetrock and not very absorptive. 
<laughs> have I checked out the new Radio Master Ranger? I have. I released a review of it. It's uh, it's being able to go up to two watts is pretty exciting. Are the Epson Movero BT35E any good? Uh, I don't think they're very good as FPV goggles. What are we talking about here, first of all? The Epson Movero BT35E smart glasses. Uh, seamlessly blend digital content to the outside world. So this is uh, basically augmented reality goggles. Which overlay... Can we got a, Can we get any like picture of what the actual overlay looks like? No. Uh, how about this? Ah, again! I wanted to go to YouTube, you sob. Google, I hate you. I just want to go to YouTube. I need to fix this. Can I see what the damn? screen looks like he's showing me the goggles show me the screen show me what it looks like in my eyeballs nope uh-huh show me what it looks like in my eyeballs all right so they show it with dji drones Jeez, it looks cold. Don't do that. They show it outputting the screen from the DJI drones, and the selling point is that you can still see outside the goggles with the screen overlaid, like a picture-in-picture. -picture. Okay. Please let me just see it. Shine a camera through the lens. Oh, man. You're killing me. No one can do this. No one can actually just shine a camera through the lens and let me see what it looks like. Oh, oh, hang on, hang on. Thank you. Whoever you are, thank you. I know it's difficult. That's not the point. There you go. So that's what you see. Okay. Can you, can you, can you see why this is a bad, this is not a good experience for an FPV drone? Yeah. No, this is terrible. It's just a tiny, tiny little screen that pops up in there. Now, the advantage would be if you just like, if you just needed a glance at your screen, but still maintain line of sight, like Athix FPV says, you could technically comply with the FAA. I agree. I agree. You could technically maintain line of sight with your drone while still not really being able to see your FPV feed. I don't think it's a very good I don't think it's, I wouldn't spend, I certainly wouldn't spend $800 on it. Why the hell would you spend $800 on this? Yeah, no, that seems excessive. Um, especially because during the day, it's going to be super bright. Are you going to be able to even see your feed? Yeah. Uh, so that's going to be a no for me. Oh, oh, man. Oh, my goodness. Adit Chauhan. Uh, I've been using the DYS XSD 12 amps on my 5-inch quad. Should I replace it with 20 amps? Um, I'm impressed that your 5-inch flies at all on a 12-amp ESC. I'm going to guess you're not flying very hard. Uh, I don't know. I, I de Based on your name, I'm going to guess that you're in a part of the world. And based on the fact that you're using DYS 12 amp ESCs, I'm going to guess you're in a part of the world where just buying the latest and greatest stuff is too expensive or you can't get it shipped to you. And so I don't know what parts are available to you. I don't know what, like, if you're using 12 amp ESCs with 2203 motors, on a 3S battery, yeah, okay. Um, I would need to know a lot more about what's available to you to suggest what you should do to upgrade your gear. Uh, I think it's gonna be pretty tricky for me to advise you. 
um, because like, should you go to 20 amp ESCs? I mean, I mean, you should go to 45 amp ESCs, but then that assumes that you have 2207 motors. So I don't know what you have available to you. Uh, but yes, I would say definitely I'd want to be on more than 12 amp ESCs if I was doing five inch freestyle. Jeffy the Quick, it's true that there are other search engines. Google is like clearly the best search engine though. Right? Timbo Slice, thanks for a $5 super chat. Says, I bought into the Maple Wireless Mjolnir DJI goggle antennas. It works very well for Bando style environments compared to stock anyways. Timbo Slice, I, I have never debated that the Mjolnir antennas work better than the stock ones. Here's the thing, though. You take the two DBI stock antennas, you put a massive high-gain patch array on there. Obviously, yeah, you better, it better work. It ought to work better. No shit. Sorry, Timbo, I don't mean no shit like, like, it sounds like I'm saying no shit, what you should, you're dumb. No, no, I don't mean it that way. I mean, like, yeah, of course, it's going to work better. Uh, my my sort of beef, if you will, with the uh, Mjolnir Pro is that the first of all, the Mjolnir Pro and the the original Mjolnir antennas, they talk this nonsense about polarization that they have like mixed cross polarization. I don't remember the exact BS, uh, and I am not a, a, an RF engineer per se, but I do have a lot of experience working with antennas. I, I designed and built wireless uh, Wi-Fi networks for a long time. I'm not a complete noob and I have some basic understanding of how RF works. And when you tell me you've got these mixed antennas, I go, okay, well, here are the situations that would have to exist for a left hand and a right hand antenna mixed polarization to actually improve things. And I go, that doesn't seem very realistic to me. And then Wesley Vardy did a test on the Mjolnir antenna. He did a long range test and he compared it to the iFlight Crystal. And the, it didn't get, it got about the same range as the iFlight Crystal. If you want to know the exact numbers, go look at Wesley Vardy's test, but it didn't do significantly better than the iFlight Crystal. And the Maple Wireless guys said, oh, it was a bad test. This is not a direct quote, but this is the gist of what they said. They basically said Wesley's test was a bad test and he didn't know what he was doing. I'm like, oh, okay. Now I just, now I just don't like you personally. And Wesley did another test where he was like, okay, and he's right about this. The place where mixing left and right hand polarization would theoretically benefit would be in a high multipath environment. And so he took it to a parking garage and he tested it in a parking garage and it didn't do any better than the iFlight Crystal. So what's the takeaway for the, Mjol for the Mjolnir Pro or the Mjolnir? It costs, how much does it cost? costs a hundred and ten dollars oh and in order to they say in order to get the best performance out of it you also have to replace all your antennas on your quads so you're going to be buying another set of antennas for all your quads too you can't use the stock antennas because they don't have the right polarization for this woo woo nonsense that that isn't that doesn't it's that i don't believe in so for a hundred and ten dollars versus the iFlight Crystal, $45. I think it's a little more with the Omnis. So the Mjolnir is twice as expensive as the iFlight Crystal. And it doesn't, I mean, it, here's the thing. It does work fine with the stock antennas on your Vista because this left-hand, right-hand stuff is kind of woo-woo nonsense anyway. But according to them, you also need to upgrade the antennas on your VTXs if you really want the best performance. Wait, that's for the air unit. How would it even work with the How would it even work with the Vista which has only one antenna? I didn't even think of that until this very moment. If you're flying the Vista, what do you do? 
So you've got this cross-polarized left-hand, right-hand array that's supposed to be helping you out. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. Long story short, it's twice as expensive as the iFlex crystal and in testing doesn't perform any better. So unless you can... Sh now, Wesley Vardy is just one man and he just did one test. But unless you can show me an actual structured test, and I don't mean like, check it out, guys, I took it to a bando and flew it and it looks real good. I say that as someone who has been guilty of doing that kind of test in the past. I, I admit that. <laughs> I'm, I am also guilty of that. But unless you can... Sh Here's the thing. Unless you can show me a test where you demonstrate that your weirdo marketing claims are true, I don't believe you. Now, it's a cool looking antenna. It's a cool freaking antenna. It looks badass. I'm I'm not willing to pay $110 for a, for a badass looking antenna. I'd rather pay $45 for the crystal, but that's just me. Anyway, uh, Kenny Kobe, I I don't understand what you're saying, man. The DJI isn't going to pick up the cross polarization the same way it does with the receiver, the way DJI did with U Sync, and that's what they're trying to replicate. I'm trying to I'm trying to parse that, but I'm not really following. The other thing is, the other thing is, here's the other thing. If DJI thought that the system would be improved by having two left and two right hand polarized antennas, do you think DJI would have just given you two left and two right hand polarized antennas? The Here's the thing. I have worked with antenna systems that combined left and right polarization or that combined vertical and horizontal polarization to get additional range, throughput, whatever you want to call it. The radio is designed that way. The antenna is designed to work with the radio, and it's all part of a system. If a, if a system is designed to be used with all the same polarization antennas, it's not really it would take an extremely specific set of circumstances to make it better to then just use cross polarized antennas. That's see what I mean. DJI designed the system to be used with all the same polarization. Nobody can tell me why it's better to have some left and some right that they can make up some marketing claims that don't actually seem to match the way reality works. And, and there's no tests to back it up. All right. I have a set. I have a set of these antennas. They sent, they sent me a set. They said, do you want to review it? And I said, send it to Wesley Vardy and have him do a long range test. And if he, if he demonstrates in your long range test that you beat just a regular patch antenna, then I will sing your praises. And he didn't. And then they said his test was flawed and he did it wrong. And I was like, okay, I see, I see where we're at. Um. Um, all righty. So that's my take on the uh, Maple Wireless Mjolnir. It's a good looking antenna. It's overpriced and it doesn't do what they say it does. And the things that they say it does don't make sense in terms of like how antenna and radio systems and my understanding of how they work. Harry Cash, thanks for a three dollar super chat. Appreciate it. OcuSync. Oh, Kenny Kobe. You're talking about OcuSync. Kenny Kobe, I, I don't know how OcuSync works, but if you were to tell me 
that OcuSync is designed to combine left and right hand polarized signals to do some kind of multiplexing and increase the, I would believe you. But here's the thing, if that's true, then OcuSync is designed to take advantage of the antenna polarization in some way. You can't just take a radio system that isn't designed to take advantage of polarization diversity and slap polar, cross-polarized antennas on it and think you're going to make things better, is my, is my belief. All right. Uh, that's enough of that topic. That's enough of that topic. Um, Christian Buffard. I think I answered this question earlier, Christian. I guess you missed it. I want to change the VTX on the baby eight, but there's no VBAT on board. You could just solder directly to the, uh, where the, where the XT, XT30 connector connects to the flight controller to get VBAT. For a Cinewhoop 3.5, I would not use my flight controller, King Pupra. Thank you for a $10 super chat. For a Cinewhoop 3.5, I would use a toothpick flight, a 25 millimeter toothpick style flight controller. That's what it's designed for. It's not designed for a 30 millimeter flight controller, I don't believe. Kenny Kobe, uh, my, they're trying to replicate how the DJI drone works, how it picks up the better signal. Kenny, I, I don't... I, I don't... What are they trying to replicate about how it works, Kenny? What are they trying to replicate about how it works? Tell me what they're trying to replicate. Tell me the technical... I, I, do you, Kenny, do you understand what they're doing or have you just read their marketing stuff and now you think, Kenny, Kenny, here, here's the thing, Kenny, are you an expert on radio systems? If you are, I res, you know, all due respect, my guess is you're not. And my guess is that both you and I have read the Mjolnir wireless marketing and now you're trying to explain it to me, but you don't actually fully understand it any more than I do, at which point you're trying to explain it to me isn't contributing to the conversation. I also read their marketing materials. Unless you have more technical insight than I do, you're not helping. Right? That pisses me off about Reddit. We'll go on a little side rant here. I know you guys love rants. I'm going to sneeze first. Hold on. <coughs> One of the things that pisses me off the most about Reddit is when people who have no effing idea what they're talking about take a shot at answering a question. They're like, well, I think blah, blah, blah. And it's like two things. If you don't know, then you're not helping. You're just ma you're just adding noise to the conversation. You're not actually you're not actually helping the person answer their question. And number two, on Reddit, there's a fair chance that someone who's actually an expert will come by and answer the question, right? You know, you got a question about underwater basket weaving in the 14th century in 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 uh, in Poland. Well. Probably someone on Reddit is an expert in that. So, Kenny, I agree that they don't work. I agree that they don't work. And we're on the same page there. It's like, listen, listen. And I find myself doing this too. Because you want to be helpful. And you want to participate in the conversation. If you don't actually know the answer, don't guess. Don't just like post, be like, well, I guess blah, blah, blah. Well, I think it's probably because blah, blah, blah. Someone else will come along who knows the answer. Abra the Ham says, now try imagine being a doctor in the last couple of years. Yeah. 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 There's nothing sexier on Reddit than someone saying, 
here are my credentials and here is my answer. You know, when someone says, well, I am not a specialist in infectious medicine, but I am an internist. And uh, when I took my, when I did my residency, here's what we did. But uh, if a specialist in infectious medicine comes along, then uh, you should probably listen to that. I'm like, oh, oh, yes, yes, qualified information from people with credentials. Oh, so good. Yeah, but, but Kenny, the thing is, I know you weren't sticking up for them. I'm glad to hear you weren't sticking up for them. It's nice to agree with you that they don't work. But you're explaining their selling concept because you think I don't understand their selling concept. I understand their selling concept. This is how women must feel all the time. Because, Kenny, you've been explaining this to me for the last 10 minutes. I understood it the whole time. Is this what mansplaining feels like? I understand their marketing concept. I've demonstrated that understanding. You could give me the benefit of the doubt and assume that I understand it. Maybe you're not talking to me. Maybe you're talking to the rest of the chat. All right. I don't want to sound like I'm picking on you, but it's... It, 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 I don't know. Let's just let it go, Kenny. Let's just move on. Mad Normal has a great question. Mad Normal says, why does the new, this is a terrible picture, why does the new DJI O3 air unit have two antenna connectors coming off it but going to one antenna? Um, uh, yeah, I've seen this picture before. Uh, bear in mind that just because the, the, uh, the antenna elements are housed inside the same plastic housing doesn't mean that there aren't two separate antenna elements in there. So what this means is that they have two driven antenna elements inside the same plastic housing. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's unusual, but it, it is not unheard of. Presumably, you can also use it with separate antennas. <laughs> Uh, Doslik98, uh, I don't know anything about the Hero Session 6, except that I have heard from people that it does exist. Does DJI combine 2.4 and 5.8 gig antennas? I'm not sure about that, PCCB, whoa. Uh, the DJI FPV drone uses both frequencies and there are multi-band antennas on the, uh, goggles. That's interesting. Oh, I just thought of something. I can't tell you about it, but I just thought of something. What functionality will be removed from the goggles to light, asks Billy Ocean. So for those who don't know, there is a rumor uh, based on a, a parts list, a SKU that was leaked by uh, a DJI leaker who uh, Blunty at least says is pretty reliable. We covered it on the news. I don't remember exactly which leaker it was. Um, uh, that said that there would be a light version of the DJI goggles too uh, with, I think they said that it was going to remove the head tracker and remove the touchpad and replace it with buttons. I don't know what else they might remove. Hmm. 
Hmm. Oh my goodness gracious. Um, DLMI Driss uh, suggests that it's a 2.4 gig antenna for a receiver and a 5.8 gig antenna for a VTX. That's not how the previous DJI systems have worked, I don't think. Um, the VTX and the the uh, controller like share the same radio unit. It's not like there's a separate receiver in there. It's a digital data connection uh, that they share. Can you run an Express LRS module on a Spectrum IX12? I think so, because I'm pretty sure... If that radio sports Crossfire, then yes. Oh my goodness, there's some drama in the chat. Um, Adit... No one's mad at you. You were spamming the chat. You were repeating your question too often. One of the moderators timed you out. You need to not post your question so often because not everybody wants to see it. So, so often. Uh, no one's angry at you. You just, they were just, you got timed out to say, hey, stop spamming the chat. Uh, a lot of people's questions don't get answered. Uh, just because the chat goes by too fast. There's nothing wrong. No one's mad at you. Just chill out and be cool. Um, you can always just email me if you want me to answer your question personally. If I'm going to sell an Express LRS quad, how do I do it so the next guy doesn't have binding issues? Uh, Papa Midnight. Papa Midnight, the very first thing I do when I get a new Express LRS piece of hardware is I flash it. And I think that this is, I think everybody who uses Express LRS should just make a habit of doing this. Number one, because chances are it's not on the latest version, right? Chances are they released a new version with some cool new features that you want. But um, what I would do is I would just give it to him and say, you need to flash this with your bind phrase. Now, if this is a person who doesn't like to use bind phrases and they like to use the button press or the plug unplug thing, uh, is you could reflash it and delete the bind phrase. That's what you could do. You could also, let's pull up ExpressLRS Configure Rater. So if we look at my Express LRS configurator, I'm just going to pick anything. You can see here that I've got a binding phrase and a home Wi-Fi SSID and a home Wi-Fi password. That's all stuff that's personal to you that he doesn't need. So you could flash it and you could uncheck those things. And then you just have a very basic setup. But they should really flash it. And when they flash it, they'll be good to go because it'll have all the correct settings for them. Nope. There we go. Thank you, Deuce, for a $10 super chat. Uh, Data Kartik says, I've recently upgraded a Cadix Vista firmware with FPV WTF for an OSD. I think I burned out the TX. It's still working, but no OSD. Can I roll back to factory firmware again? You can. Um... You could just uninstall WTFOS. I don't that I don't know if that'll change the if your TX pad is burned out, then you have to repair that or it's not gonna work. Uh flying grip, for me at least, the Radio Master Ranger clicks in securely into the module bay on my TX sixteen S.
Uh, Shajik J asks, in one of the pictures that's been leaked, we can see the option to choose between Mavic, Avada, DJI 03, and old DJI FPV system. Can we expect backward compatibility? Shajik, DJI has said that they're going to implement backwards compatibility. Uh, we don't know what form that will take. That leak could be seen as evidence that they are progressing in that direction. Uh, that, and if that's true, then that's good news, I suppose. As always with DJI, I want to see the final product before I pass judgment because uh, sometimes DJI doesn't do the things that they suggest that they're going to do. Uh, and sometimes they do them, but they don't do them in exactly the way with all of the exact features that you would have hoped. And so it, it, we need to wait. But yeah, I have seen that. I have seen that. Okay, this is it. We're just timing people out. We're just timing people out. That's it. Everybody gets timed out. I'm going to time everybody out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's a timeout party. Everyone who chats is going to get timed out. Yep, you. Except Adit. Adit is not going to get timed out. It's just going to be me and him, and we're going to talk. Okay, here we go. Yep, yep. I don't know if I can time out a moderator. Yep, I can. I timed him out. Okay, Siati, you're you're out of here. I, I, I'm guessing that by the time I finish timing everybody out, some of the people who were timed out will, uh, co will come out of timeout. I think it's a 300-second timeout. Yeah, everybody's getting timed out. All right, moderators, start timing people out. Don't ban them. Don't ban them from the channel. Please don't do that. That'll be so annoying to have to go back and fix that. Let's just start putting everybody into timeout. Yeah. Timeout. The stream is going off the rails. Timeout. All right. Yep, everybody. Jeremy Sarge. Hey, Jeremy, that's over the line. Time out. <laughs> Fubeka, you're out of here. You're timed out. <laughs> ZFPV, how dare you ask that? You're timed out. <laughs> Bobby Bags. Time out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the stream is almost over. I'm just being dumb. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, what, uh, yeah. what's happening? You're getting timed out. That's what's happening. Oh, yeah, the, the mods are on it. <laughs> Mr. Syncopad, how dare you say that? Time out. <laughs> oh no, don't time out, Scott. Don't time out, Scott. He's actually asking a sincere question. I'm an immigrant from Siberia. My parents left Siberia and I'm living in my comrade's house. It's been hard because I want to go to Yale. However, I have a GPA of 3.2. What route do I go? I don't know why you think I'm qualified to ask this question. I did not have a great GPA. I did not go to Yale and I'm not from Siberia. I don't know what to tell you, man. I have nothing to contribute to this question. Good luck with your education and time out. Uh, apparently mods can still, mods can still talk even when they're timed out. Data Kartik, uh, to, to fix the problem, cannot load firmware list. Data, go watch my review of the Runcam Wasp. The Runcam Wasp video shows how to fix this problem. I show how to fix that error. That's all I'm going to tell you. Now, time out! 
Timeout. Everybody gets a timeout. It's a timeout party. Okay. Uh, <laughs> only the mods are left. <laughs> That's that's it, folks. We're done. We're done. We're done for the day. Thank you guys for coming out. Uh, I will see you tomorrow night uh, at eight for the uh, for the uh, for the for the Monday night stream, and uh, we'll try not to time out anybody. But that's gonna do it. It's only five. It's five minutes to the end of the hour. I don't even care anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, Y'all go check out Ciotti's stream. And uh, have a great stream, Ciotti. Bye, everybody. Oh. Oh. That's it. I'm done. Later.